And this is not just a speed thing. It's not that Ethernet is just faster than all these um, um, enemies. You know, Ethernet started at 2.94 megabits per second and then went up a factor of four to 10 gig. Then it went down to uh, 10 meg. Then it went down to one meg briefly. Then went up to 10. Then it went to 100 gig, 10 gig. Here we are on our way to terabit. And it wasn't just a media thing. You know, we started, you know, Aloha Net, the predecessor of Ethernet, was wireless. We went on to thick coax, then thin coax, and then with that experiment with FiberNet that didn't work, the 150 megabits in 1978. Then we went to copper pairs, then optical again, and now we're at wireless. But it's not just those media changes. And it's not just that Ethernet is aggressively digital and packet and distributed, contrary to its opponents. There is, in fact, an Ethernet business model, which I think is the reason that it wins. And let me list the sketch that model. It has six parts. The Ethernet business model, which is applicable to many other technologies, A, begins with a de jure standard, not de jure standard, de, uh, not French, Latin, de jure, meaning a really hard-nosed standard made by a, a legitimate standards body. Uh, in Ethernet's case, the IEEE. And on that front, I would give Ethernet an A and Sonnet a B. That is, in terms of standardization. We just heard talk of alien wavelengths. You know, that's a failure of the Sonnet standard that people can talk about alien wavelengths. I mean, why shouldn't Dr. Paul have his long-haul card in his router sending long-haul uh, lambdas into that fiber. Why shouldn't it? Well, because they're alien wavelengths, meaning the standards that have been made allow the optical people to disallow the computer people from sending alien wavelengths over their fiber. Another failure, of course, is the fact that you can't connect two transport systems from two different vendors together. There is no mid-span compatibility. That is a failure of standardization. Ethernet gets an A, Sonnet gets a B. In fact, I think B is generous. <laughs> Second part of the Ethernet business model is that the implementations are owned. This is not an open source world. Ethernet has not been an open source world. Neither has Sonnet. I give you both an A. Fierce competition follows. Now, that's certainly been true of Ethernet. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of Ethernet vendors slitting each other's throats on a daily basis. I know. The scars here. I give Ethernet an A. I give Sonnet a C. You know, Sonnet came out of this, you know, you remember Western Electric came out of this monopoly mindset. And sure, there's some competition, but it's, it's, it's not like what it needs to be. And then there's interoperability. Among all this fierce competition in Internet space, there's a rule. You cannot compete by being inter incompatible. The market won't let you sell a non-compatible Ethernet product. They have to interrupt. Multi-vendor interoperability is required. So Ethernet interoperability gets an A, and Sonnet gets a D because of those damn alien wavelengths and forward error correction and control plane variations and things which have not been properly standardized. The fifth part of the model is rapid evolution after market engagement. So that's why Ethernet has changed media, it has changed speeds, it has changed from shared to uh, dedicated bandwidth, etc. Uh, 10x per generation gets an A, whereas there's um, Sonnet plugging along for, I don't know why exactly, gets a B for a 4x rate of um, improvement. And finally, the sixth, the sixth part of this model is preservation of the installed base, which Ethernet works very hard to do. And I'd give uh, Ethernet an A, and I'll give um, Sonnet an A+. Because if there's one thing that Sonnet does, is that it preserves the install base. And uh, we'll return to that point in a moment. On top of that winning business model is another thought which bears emphasis, and you even heard it in Dr. Paul's talk. One of the reasons Ethernet has won is that Ethernet understands its position in the architecture. That is, the Internet, one of the brilliant ideas in the Internet is layering. You've heard of the seven levels of the ISO reference model. And there's been considerable discipline in the Internet about those layers. And there was poor little Ethernet at the bottom um, 
knowing that it didn't have to do all that much. It just had to be fast and simple and cheap. And then a lot of other stuff would get handled by the high level, um, higher level protocols. Uh, a good standard has little or no options. So when you all go to make the 40G and the 100G and the terabit standards, no options are allowed. Anything which is not mandatory is prohibited. Interoperability is the goal, multi-vendor interoperability. Certifying something to be a standard does not work unless it results in interoperability among multiple standards. So a failure mode is to put all your emphasis in certification and no emphasis in interoperability, and that doesn't work as well. So no embrace and extend strategies. You know, we're going to do we're going to do OC768, but we're going to do it with our own forward error correction, and our own control plane, and our own this and our own that. So therefore, our boxes will only talk to our boxes. It's not allowed. And in particular, the customers have to behave better. The carriers, when they issue their long RFPs in which they specify all sorts of special doodads that they require for their network, they're driving the vendors into vendors into carrier-specific implementations away from interoperable standards. So here we are at the um, Ethernet has finally caught up to Sonnet. That's a good way to think of it. And it is 10x eventually catches us up to 4x, uh, and we're at this 10 gig crossover. And the hope is, of course, as you just heard, that we won't then fall down onto a 4x. But we'll continue on the 10x curve. That is rapid technological innovation. Uh, 40 gig is shipping today in those 50 gigahertz channels at long haul within the current 10 gig infrastructure, thanks to a lot of hard work. I believe 100 gig will follow in the same um, happy outcome. That is, a, a lot of hard work and spectral efficiency will allow us to do 100 gig inside of the existing infrastructure for 10 gig. The same fibers, the same regenerators, the same repeaters, the same huts, the same multiplexers. But terabit is probably not going to fit in the current infrastructure. That is, in order to get to terabit Ethernet, I think we're going to have to uh, break out of a lot of the constraints that we take. We're going to have to break out of 1,500 nanometers. We're going to have to break out of 50 gigahertz spacing. We're going to have to invent new modulation schemes, uh, eliminate regenerators and repeaters. And that is a hard thing to predict. That is, the outcome of that process leading to terabit will be chaotic. It depends on the applications. As Gilda write about the zettabyte uh, internet, will the internet architecture change? I'm going to propose that it does change, but will it change? How will the competition work out among the vendors? How will standards be made? Will the IEEE and the ITU continue what looks like a positive path of cooperation, we can hope? Will the standards be good standards, or will they be kind of option-heavy, non-interoperable standards, we can hope. Uh, it'll be chaotic, 